Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm, my name's Kenzie. I'm a new new Banjima man. And I've been living in Perth for the last ooh, 15 years. So um, I'm not originally from here. So before I get started, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners, to the land we're gathering on, um, to the Wajak Noongar people of the, ooh, it went loud, to the Noongar nation. Um, I'm very grateful to be here and to be living on this land and to learn so much from the people that come from this area. Um, can everyone hear me? getting recorded. All right, sorry. Um, yeah, so Nyonyo is... Uh, has everyone seen the Australian traditional map? So Nyonyo is a small community just 200 kilometers out of Broome. To put it in more, I guess... Has everyone seen the movie Brand New Day? Yep. Yeah. So a lot of that movie was filmed in Beagle Bay. So that's where my dad's from. And growing up in a small town, pretty much we knew everyone. Everyone knew my family. My traditional, my surname is Dan, so my dad is very well known. He comes from a huge family. And I guess I was sort of struggling today what I wanted to talk about. And I knew just sharing my story, because that's a lot of what I do, especially in the prison and whether people get something from it i'm grateful but whether they use a lot of my own mistakes that i've made through growing up and lived experiences then i'm grateful for that as well but growing up um i come in a family of just males um i'm one of five boys so even my mum is a male so she's very Tomboyish, she, to put it in her words, she calls herself the alpha female. Um, my dad's very quiet, reserved, he just goes along with it, he's very cruisy. Um, my brother, I'm the second oldest, so growing up in a big family, like all males, we always struggled to get in touch with our feelings and emotions at a young age, and also to be seen and heard. And the way I did that was I always did the bad things in life. My brother was a high achiever, straight A's. He was a champion football player. He got trophies after trophies. And I was the one getting into mischief, hanging with the wrong crowd as well. Just to be heard, just to be seen. Whether just some attention from family. And sometimes it didn't work well. I got in trouble with the law a lot. Um, drugs and alcohol. Fighting was also a little outlet. Um, when we were very young, we, in Broome, has anyone been to Broome? Yeah. So Broome is very boring. Um, <laughs> I know people, it's good if you're there for two weeks, but if you're there for more than two weeks, oh my God, you, you have to get a hobby. So um, I did Taekwondo and we did boxing and football and rugby and every other sport, but it was weird. My sporting background is so huge and all these experiences, but I was still fat as a fat, chubby little kid and, in, and insecure and getting into trouble and mischief. But, and my brother was just, he was a role model in school. Everyone looked up to him. First place, first place. So uh, I was just trying to find where I fit in in the family. And um, I went to a Catholic school. My family is Catholic. Um, St. Mary's College, and that's where I got, a, got into so much mischief because there's a lot of things I've did to students, to teachers. Pranks were my outlet, but they didn't, they didn't find it too funny. Um, and then they sent me down here, went back in 2002. So I've been in Perth for, since then. They sent me down here. I always tell people a different story where I wanted to move here to clinch every opportunity that Perth had to offer. But my parents sent me here because I was going on one-way path down to destruction, doing, using drugs at a young age. Um, so when I moved down here, I 
relocated in a boys' hostel with a lot of boys from up north, Aboriginal boys, and we all just bounced off each other. Like, it's like we were cut from the same mold. Cloth, sorry. Um, I went to Aramore Catholic College. That's in Leederville, another um, very high prestige school. So, and during my time there, I had a, I grew up with a group of boys in Broome, and they all moved down with me. They moved to different schools, Trinity, um, Aquinas, and Aramore as well. But the group of boys I grew up with, there was just four of us. And one of them was one who was struggling with a lot of things. And our nickname for him was Big Baby. We call him Big Baby because he was this big, massive, Maori, Aboriginal boy who took everything personal. He had a big heart. He was so sensitive. And we went to Aramore together. After Aramore, we went, we moved in together. We stayed. We went to uni. But I noticed he was changing over the years. And he was struggling. He couldn't watch news without taking it personal. And he sees things happening in the community, things happening around the world. And he would question society and people. Like he had a small opinion about people. And I would just, I didn't think much of it at the time until one day he had enough of Perth and he moved back down to Broome. He got caught up with heavy drugs, and then I got the phone call when I was um, coming back from uni that he committed suicide. And at that moment, it didn't sink in when you hear that because growing up in Broome, suicide is not, it's not rare. It's, it's sad to say it, but suicide in Broome, when someone passes away through suicide, people's reaction is just like, oh, that's sad. That's terrible. It's not like it doesn't shock the community like it used to. But when it happened to him, it took me down a spiral. So once we started questioning what's going on, what's going, like, even our, ourselves, like, we're all Aboriginal boys and we've seen, we started taking noticing things that were happening around society, how we were being treated. And then I started using. I started using heavy drugs. I came back to Perth. Um, I would go out drunk, high, and I would play footy all the time. Sometimes I would play on speed, which is stupid. But, and my family didn't, had no idea until my brother brought it up. He said, he told my mum, hey, this Kenzie's really, he's, He's not talking to anyone, he's locked himself, he drinks, he's taking heavy drugs. So, but the way that what brought it out of it, I had my own, my uncle, he helped mentor me. So rather than telling me what's right and wrong, he got to the, down to the root of it. So I felt powerless to help people around me at the time, my own best friend. So I just thought, this is what society, this is how we view Aboriginal people. Because if you research it, Aboriginal people have the highest rate in suicide. So I just thought, oh, if it happens, it happens. So I didn't care too much. Um, and my uncle, he, he's, he's no longer with me at the moment, but at the time he went above and beyond to help me. Um, he got down to the root of it, root of it and we, took me to counselling down here to find out what's going on. And I admitted to the counsellor that I just feel powerless, like you can't help anyone. Like what's my purpose? And then I went back up north for a couple of months. I went on country. Um, and it was, it's hard to describe it when I guess it's hard to describe it to other people if they're not from the same culture, because I always struggle with that part. But as I've seen in my own little circle how people are going down that same path with drugs and alcohol, they're fighting their own battles. And eventually I pushed through it. Um, 
with family support. Um, my parents, my dad was the was the major um, influence on that. But once I got through it, it took me about three years, and then I started playing footy. Well, I was always playing footy, but I knew footy was a good way to help me keep to keep me motivated. And then I did my knee. I did my knee back when I was playing for South Frio 2009. And once that happened, it just all hell went loose. Um, I was using again. So, because I thought that was my purpose, to be a role model in sport. Because how many, how many times we see Aboriginal role models in sport? Um, so, once I did my knee, I was drinking every day. I put on so much weight. I was using again. And family once again came to my aid. My uncle was a strong support for me. And I, I don't know how I came, I don't know how I got through that, but my knee healed, but it still didn't heal me inside, because I always look at that as my, that's my identity. So, so that's why I asked for the chair, because I can't really sit on the floor. So, um, and I guess a lot of my own experiences has always been around mental health because I know, I do know, I'm aware of what I struggle with personally. And I don't know if we mentioned it earlier that I'm, I'm a counsellor at the moment. Um, I'm still studying. I work at Headspace and also I work in the prison. And it's, it's something that I really value because I get something out of it. I know we all do jobs and we find our purpose but it's almost like every time I help someone it heals me as well and I've really pushed for this idea to run a mentoring course in prison um, youth prison so Bankshire Hill and at the time I was working at AIM mentoring which we were based at Murdoch University anyone has heard of AIM? And yeah so I was one of the managers at Murdoch and it was a great idea and I went to the CEO and I said, we got to run this in prison. And his reaction was just like, no, it's too much of a liability, it's too risky. So, and he basically suggested, if you want to do that, you're going to have to do it on your own. And I said, all right, I will. And I told him I quit. And his face was like, what? Because I've been there for two years and he's like, no, I quit. Because I'm so certain is why, why I'm here. I'm here because if you see a kid on the street, you see kids struggling and uh, stealing and youth, like that's where my main focus is. And once we ran the first mentoring program in prison, we had, I recruited all these mentors, about six, seven of them. They were all nervous and worried, which understandable when you go to prison. Well, when we walked in the room, they had like 18 young boys. My eyes just lit up because I saw myself at each one of them. I seen up, oh, he, he presents something. I see myself in him, see myself in him, see myself in him. Because I was like that, but I had the strong support at home. I had the good parents. I had an uncle that wasn't going to give up on me. So I always look at it the power of mentoring. Like, we all have a mentor, safe to say, yep. Um, where I would be without my mentor, it's kind of scary to think about it because I still know there's a lot of stuff that I need to work on, personally. I still have a trust issue, I'm still insecure about a lot of things, um, anxiety. But when I do the, I guess when I'm in prison is where I, the, I'm most happy. If that sounds pretty messed up, but it's like if I have a bad day at work, and it's happened plenty of times. Like I'm like, ah, oh, this job, this manager is just pain in the ass. But it's good because another hour, then I'm going to prison, and then they're like, why do you really, really look forward to it? Of course I do, because because in prison, every time I've been there, yeah, you have your ups and downs, but every at least you're aware of it. There's no, I guess, there's no bullshit when you work in prison. 
they'll tell you they don't hide behind a keyboard or they don't hide behind if you like them or not. You know, they just say, hey, my life is like this, whether you shy away or whether, whether you're used to it or whether you're there so to provide support. Like, that's where I guess it's not, I'm not ashamed to say, like, I really thrive in that environment. And with the counselling, I've only just started counselling my own clients this year. So it's um, each session presents all these opportunities for me as well, like to connect with young people, people in general. Like I, I don't like to say that I'm wise. Like I'm, a lot of people do say you're wise, but um, for a young person. But I just say no. Nah, just just be genuine, like everyone has that ability to connect with someone, whether, but we always have influences that change that, whether it's the media, oh, the media is so, sh oh, I was gonna swear, but, <laughs> but the media is so crap, like, you look at people um, influenced by the media, all these other outlets that just helps you, and you heard people say, I don't judge people, I don't say that anymore because I'm a human being and human beings judge people. Yeah, like if I said the woman's AFL, oh, it's not my thing. I guarantee you, you see some people like, oh, what is he, sexist? But that's not the case because they play better footy than me. So, but it's, yeah, I guess part of my journey, I'm not even, I just go along with the flow type of thing. If opportunity presents itself, I'm always taking it by both hands, which before I didn't. And I always ask myself, every time when I feel a certain way, I say, why am I feeling this way? Why am I doing this? Why am I not taking this opportunity? Where now, in the last four years, I just like, if someone wants me to do this, and then I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Sean invited me. I was a bit nervous, but I was saying, why am I nervous? And Sean, Sean's my uncle, and he was just like, you gotta get out there, present yourself. You're a young man, you, you're getting close to 33, and you gotta have a name for yourself. And I always thought like, oh, I'm not that type of guy to brag and want this image about yourself. Um, but reality is, you know, it's not about me. Like, I've never, been the one to toot my own horn. Like, I would go out of my way for people who, who really want help. But, and with my journey, I know it's just, I'm barely scratching the surface. And I'm not ashamed to say, for my own potential, I'm just touching the surface with that as well. Um, growing up in Broome, you're very isolated. So it's like you're hidden away from the world. And even moving down here was scary, but then I adjusted. Traveling overseas, I was scared, but I adjusted. My first traveling experience was in Thailand. And man, even that experience just blew my mind because when you're in a different country, you realize how well you got it here. You take things for granted. You take people for granted, the opportunities for granted. So it's like, I believe things happen for a reason. And the only person that can truly, that truly determine your own pathway is yourself. Um, and I always look at my mistakes as like opportunities for me. Um, with the prison program, it's, I've been running it for about four years now, so and I definitely don't want to give it up. I want to be there full time, actually, but they won't allow me to. Um, and with the headspace um, counselling, I've run my own youth program, so to get kids off the street, just to provide that environment for them, that get them to connect with other people, other youth workers, other mentors. Like that's because, like I said before. Every kid I've seen, I've worked with, who presents trouble issues, what other people say, I always see myself in them. 
like if a kid is on the street wandering, wandering around lost, I always say, yep, I was there. I did that. So, and when people say, I don't judge people, I'm like, well, you're a human being. Like, just ask yourself, why are you judging that person? Is it media influence? Is it your own personal experiences? But, yeah, so it's, I guess the message I want to leave for everyone out here is like not to let anything influences on being a human being, like at the end of the day. Like I, I am an Aboriginal man, but down but further beneath that I'm I'm a human being. And people always say, treat pe treat other people how you want to be treated. And I always ask myself, yeah, like, but we always forget to do it. If someone looks at you wrong or someone cuts you off in the car, you know, you automatically get in de defensive mode. So it's just providing, I guess, being humble. Mm. And there's days where you do struggle with that. I know I do. And just going back to the root of being human is caring for one another. I'm not sure if... I can't think of anything else I want to talk about, but it's... Um, I hope that helped. And I have presented a lot in, in my time. And it never gets easier. Like, it's... But in the prison, I don't know why, in the prison it's just easy. I don't, I don't get it. You're in a room with this amount of prisoners, males and... It's, it's different, like, I don't know. And I always ask, and when it first happened, I thought, this is a sign. I'm meant to be here. Not locked up, but helping. <laughs> so, yeah, I've, so, I hope that helped. Like, um, and I just want to thank you for uh, inviting me. Um, and my uncle for inviting me. He, he always gets me to do these things and it's, it's hard because I don't want to be that, oh, you know, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I need this, even to nominate me for awards. I've been, a lot of people wanted to not, uh, anonymate me for awards and I was just like, no, I don't, because I don't want to do it for that. Like, I don't, I just want to help people. Like, if you, it sounds bad to say, but if you need a, a, a reward for that, then, Maybe you're doing it for the wrong reason. I don't know. Like, yeah. I can't think of anything else. Thank you. <laughs>
anything to do with young people, anyone who's you know, interested in that space, they were part of that member membership. Um, and we ran a series of forums. A lot of them were obviously multicultural related and multicultural specific to young people. Um, and through that, I've been in that role for about three years. I've just changed out of that role into um, a, a more, you know, like a, yeah, a project that I've been wanting to do for years and years, and I, we just got funding for it through government. So I'm really excited to push that through, and I'll talk about that um, later in my um, presentation. But if you could go to the next slide. Um, so if you have a look, um, has anyone seen this before or ever? Yeah. <laughs> um, does anyone know where it is? Sorry? Yes. Are you guys from Afghanistan? <laughs> okay, lovely. Um, yeah, so if you could just go to the next photo, Anusha. Um, so, yeah, this is in Afghanistan. Um, so before, Afga I am from Afghanistan, <laughs> um, and I'll talk about that later on. <laughs> um, but um, it's, yeah, Afghanistan, uh, before um, Islam was brought into the country, and, you know, what's was introduced into Afghanistan, um, was actually a Buddhist country. Um, and so these were built, there was monasteries, there's about three um, Buddha statues throughout that area. And they're a sacred site for um, not just Afghans, but a lot of Buddhists in, in general, I guess. Um, but in Afghanistan, you know, they were never, um, you know, damaged or touched up or anything like that. Um, but unfortunately, in 2001, um, when the Taliban... Well, they came in 96, but in 2001, they actually um, bombed those statues. So at the moment, obviously, um, you can see the damages um, that have been done. And I think that's a, I can't see which one it is, but um, uh, I think you should see all the three. You'll see one of the larger, the larger frames. Um, but yeah, there's three large ones and they all, you know, got destroyed. But yeah, I just thought I'd share that. <laughs> um, just because when Anusha asked me to speak tonight, um, uh, it, it didn't actually click to me about uh, these statues, although they are something that we speak about um, quite a lot. And Afghanistan has, has, a, has a very rich um, history, um, and I take pride in that, and I, I love sharing uh, my culture in that aspect and mixing it up. Um, moving on, uh, so it's a bit of a timeline about my life <laughs> um, and around my personal story. So in 2000 and, um, in 1995, I was born in 1995, um, soon after um, the Taliban um, came about in Afghanistan. Um, and so for about three years or so, we were, um, you know, uh, living in Afghanistan during the war, like many other Afghans. Um, and then in 2000, and, I think in 2000, um, we uh, crossed borders off to, over to Pakistan, which a lot of Afghans did. Millions of Afghan refugees went over to um, Pakistan, some went to Iran. Um, I, I believe a lot of them did go to Pakistan just because it was a safer option. Um, my whole family did. And so in 2003, I moved to Australia, and Australia became my home. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, I was about six when we moved to Australia. Um, and it's been a very interesting experience um, growing up through the public schooling system here. Um, I lived in an area that wasn't very diverse, <laughs> so that was very interesting too. And then being, you know, visibly I am white, but um, I'm still brown, like I am an ethnic person, and so I think growing up um, it was still difficult, you know, like you don't really fit in um, into a lot of the, the different cultures that I grew up in, although people are, you know, very respectful of it. Um, it's still different when, you, when you're not in a community that, that does understand different cultures, and of course um, with Australia's history, uh, we are obviously guilty of what we've done to the First Nations people. So, you know, I, can't, I couldn't complain from a young age anyway about the mistreatment of refugee migrant people because the First Nations people were never treated well anyway, <laughs> which is something I'm trying to work towards in my current role as well. Um, so, yeah, growing up in Australia was very interesting. I could talk about that for few hours, but I don't want to bore you guys. Um, it's a bit depressing. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then moving on to 2013. So 2013, um, I had just turned 18, <laughs> um, and I didn't know what to do once I, once I finished school. Um, I just knew I wanted to go to uni. Well, I didn't want to, but, you know, being of uh, an ethnic background, you're encouraged to go to university, you know, engineer, lawyer, doctor. Although my parents did not encourage that, um, 
it's still, you know, you have to do a university degree. Being in Australia, you have to take advantage of these opportunities. Um, and so my first thing was just, you know, study something for six months, go to university after, see how I feel. Um, and during that time, um, there was, I had some challenges that came about. Um, and for me, the way I kind of, you know, um, dealt with that was volunteering and helping other people. And so um, I started a TAFE and I did youth work and community services work. So I did that for a year and a half. So I did my set four. And my set four would have gotten me into, um, <laughs> into university straight away. <laughs> uh, but then I loved it so much. Um, I really loved the counseling component and the mental health component because I was like, yes, I can power through and help my Afghan community and, you know, like be a bilingual counselor and, you know, just try to defy all odds. <laughs> um, and soon enough, um, I finished, um, and by that, by the time I was 19, um, I had worked at like five different community organizations in different spaces. And then um, my very last placement as part of my diploma, we could um, obviously, you know, they assign you a place, but I actually found a place myself, and it was helping newly arrived migrants. So through that, I actually, that really helped me you know, work with the older generation because I was only like 18 and a half at the time. A lot of other Afghans that I worked with and a lot, of, a lot of them were males. It was very interesting because even I didn't feel comfortable at the start talking to them because, you know, there's growing up Afghan, there's a lot of things you have to consider before, you know, you approach someone who is of older age or, you know, unless even if they're the same age as you, there's a lot of things you have to consider. So I was, you know, I went in there, I was quite scared, um, but you know, it taught me a lot. Um, I worked with a lot of people of the same background as me, but we were so diverse, you know, there were so many things that they taught me that I had no clue about. Um, and just seeing them, allowing them to, you know, sign up to Centrelink, go to Medicare, um, find a house. It, like we did almost every single thing that your parents probably helped you growing up here. Um, and so for me, that was really, I found that so essential and I didn't realize that this space existed and that these services were out there and available and, you know, that things can be done. Um, but once I finished my course, um, I actually did not want to work in the youth sector at all because I never thought young people would listen to me, <laughs> uh, which I was wrong. <laughs> um, and so what happened was I was working at a place called Communicare. And at the time, I was a sport ambassador. <laughs> so I, did, I played sport but in high school. And so I don't know how my amazing supervisor let me stay on in that role for so long, although I didn't play a single game. I was just, you know, we were going out to schools, uh, local communities to um, assist larger families, ethnic families, um, to take their children to uh, sporting clubs, uh, you know, basically like $50 instead of them paying like $600 for a term. So that was basically that project and obviously it, it attracted me because if, I, if we had that, I probably would have been playing sport till this day. So everything I've really worked in has been of something that I wanted and I never really found. And so I, I find it really important to be able to share those opportunities, those services that are out there and to share them within the community. Um, and my supervisor at the time at Communicare, she um, encouraged me to apply for a national summit. Um, and I had no clue what it was. I just knew it was a youth summit and it was in Sydney. And I had heard that Sydney was an amazing place. And I was like, you know what? If I want to go and meet some young people and in Sydney, why not? And I applied. I actually didn't think I was going to get in. Um, and also being Afghani, like, although my parents are quite relaxed and lovely and very supportive, Straight away, I was just thinking, oh my God, they're going to just get angry at me for going over interstate, you know? And so um, they actually tried to call me about 10 times within like two weeks and I just kept ignoring the call. And then um, I finally checked my emails and they had already booked my flights, so, which is lovely. <laughs> um, and so I went over to Sydney in 2014 and there was a national summit for multicultural young people of refugee migrant backgrounds. And I went there, I'm like, oh my God, like, this exists and this is an actual thing. Um, and I think meeting people who were, you know, of the same background, but at the same time had different journeys of migration, um, different struggles, and then them telling me what they're doing, you know. Some of them had started up their own enterprise at the, at the age of 18. Now, I'm just thinking like, wow, that is amazing. Like one of the guys that, 
who now you know runs a tiling business, and he only um, like all his employees are all refugees, because you know he finds that they are talented in that space, and so he actually employs them, and you know allows them to work in that space and make money, and you know whatever they need with their housing and things like that. So for me, I really went there and I, I met so many people and I felt so empowered. Um, and when I came back, I was, all I could think was, this needs to happen in Perth. Um, and through that, we had the Catalyst Youth Summit. So myself and four other young people, we came over to WA and we're like, we need to do the summit. We didn't know how um, deprived WA was <laughs> in the space. And so we actually had a lot of support so government really supported it. People wanted to, people I'd never heard of wanted to meet with us and wanted to fund this. But they just really liked the fact that young people, these five young people were there and they wanted something to happen and, you know, they were willing to put their money um, on this project. And so through that, um, Maya and WA came about. And the national summit that I attended in Sydney was run by Maya National. So I currently work for Maya and WA, which is the WA body of the national summit that I went to. And so we ran that successfully. Um, if you could just go to the next slide. Um, yeah, <laughs> so the Catalyst Youth Summit. So we had about, um, we've run it twice. So we've had about 120 young people um, attend, uh, including um, young organizers. So it's a youth-led initiative. So young people um, taking charge, you know, they plan the whole summit, it's a three-day summit. Um, so the first day is really them meeting, brainstorming, understanding what advocacy is. Second day, they address five key issues in their communities. So um, we've had issues such as mental health, well-being, um, violence, um, you know, there was things around justice system, domestic violence, um, and what happened on the final day is they presented um, on these issues. And from um, those summits, what has actually happened is the findings and um, what came out of that summit um, has actually gone into the Office of Multicultural Interests Youth Strategy. So they actually used that to um, obviously work better with young people of migrant refugee backgrounds. For us, that's a very big win seeing as WA didn't have such a thing at all that existed here. Um, it's been a very big win for us. But at the same time, those young people are doing amazing work till this day. Things like that are happen organically. You know, a lot of them actually came and felt just as empowered. Um, and they've gone out and about, and they're just doing some amazing work that I don't think I would have ever been able to do at their age. You know, some of them were about 18 when they came. Um, and one of the young girls, she was 19 when she attended Catalyst. She's written two children's books now and um, she's in Melbourne and all her books are being you know, sold in certain libraries around Australia, which I think is absolutely amazing. You know? And she was a um, young um, Muslim woman and she wore a hijab. And so she actually wanted to write a story about the importance of what this hijab means um, and how what, you know, to make Australia better understand this meaning of it's not just a piece of cloth, it has a more, it has you know, significant meaning behind it. Um, and so a lot of the young people are doing amazing work and I've been privileged and honored to be able to work with them and to guide them and I guess mentor them you know, to an extent, uh, not formal mentoring. Um, and then we have this thing, the second one, shout out. Um, and so I think there's about 25 young people. So they're all refugee, migrant and um, Aboriginal backgrounds. Um, and they go out to schools, to organizations, um, basically anywhere you could possibly think of, they go out, they talk about their personal stories, um, any issues they've experienced growing up, um, and sometimes they actually go to educate staff training groups, <laughs> so, uh, which, is, which is another aspect that um, you know, we've tried to incorporate into, um, into my current program that I'm running. So we've had about, I think, about 200 bookings with that, and we actually don't have someone working on it actively, which you know, says a lot around paying young people for their time and the importance of having young voices on the table and including those voices. Um, so that project is very close to my heart because we've ran that twice, the training, um, and the first round I was actually part of it, so I'm a shout-out speaker. Um, and then I think the next one is, can you tell what the third one is? Oh yes, Maya. So Maya and WA um, is the project obviously that I work on. So um, every year I've run about um, 
so throughout my time, about 12 forums. And this is more of a personal development um, and a way to get communities to come together. So for example, we had one around media representation. So what we had was we had a panel of um, speakers um, from different media organizations. So we had ABC, SBS, um, you know, a, quite a diverse panel come together and address certain issues that young people were facing. And you know, has anyone heard about the whole Sudanese youth in Victoria? about how there's gangs apparently. Um, and so it, uh, this is when I held it. So it was around that time. Um, and we found that there was a higher um, amount of young people who did attend this and found it very beneficial. Um, and then we do consultations afterwards, which actually go to our national body. And they use that for national policy work. Um, so everything that we do goes somewhere. Um, and my role was two days a week. So doing that part-time is really difficult, but we've had some amazing outcomes from the project. Um, and then the final point I want to talk about is um, something that we did nationally just last year, which was the multicultural census. So uh, myself and one of my colleagues, we went out to um, organizations and schools and spoke to about 300 young people of refugee migrant background around the social, economic, and so the indicator culture indicators. <laughs> um, and so um, we you know, asked them about how, you know, some of them had just been in Australia about six months. So a few of them we had to get translators on board, you know, we had to incorporate a diverse range of young people in this census. And although, you know, some of them had really bad experiences and we can't deny that, um, they had a very, you know, the young people that we did speak to are very resilient, very positive young people. And that came out in the research. And that was done with Melbourne University. So that's actually going um, towards more funding that they're going to be doing more local projects from just from that census. So for, that, for us, that is even an even better win because we were just asked to come on board and do the census um, with Melbourne University. Because nothing was, and I think in the whole of, the whole of um, Australia's history, there's never been a multicultural census at all for young people. It's always been just general young people. And obviously, if, you don't, if English is not your first language, you're never going to get all these diverse voices in. So luckily, myself and my colleague, we actually spoke, we speak, you know, we're bilingual. So we did go out to schools and we spoke in their languages and we made sure we, we incorporated all their experiences in there. And often, you'll meet refugee migrant youth who, um, you know, they've probably been physically attacked somewhere, but they won't tell you because they feel, they feel like it's been a privilege being in Australia and that they've been granted living here, that they don't have a human right, which is, you know, it's not correct and we should, you know, try to promote them being outwardly, um, you know, speaking about their experiences and making them feel like it's, of course, it's very important. Um, and so, yeah, that's just a bit of the work I do in at Yakwa. Um, I think the next slide. Yeah, so these are just some photos um, of the Catalyst Seed Summit. So um, the ones wearing green, that's the second round, and then the blue shirts are the 2016 delegates. Um, so yeah, there's just some photos there. Um, and then the young people at the wearing white shirts, they were the young people who actually led this, um, the Catalyst Seed Summit, and they're all volunteers. Um, and we planned this within a six month time frame, and the summer went for three days, obviously. Um, and yeah, till this day, those young people are still working within Yakwa and within WA, doing diverse things um, and making sure the outcomes of refugee migrant young people are being met and holding government accountable to that. And I think that is so important um, for young people to understand their voices and the advocacy that they need to do. Even you know, advocacy is not just you standing up on a stage as like a politician and talking about what's happening. It can be you going to a doctor's appointment with your mother and advocating on her behalf, you know. I think we need to talk about advocacy and how diverse that is. Because for me, that's really been my journey, is things that I had done at, at a young age, I'd never considered as important. I just did it because I had to do it. Um, and growing up, I've realized the importance of that. And then I think it's so important to tell young people that, you know, whatever they feel is important needs to be spoken about. And there is spaces there to talk about it. And that's what the Mayan Forums and Catalyst Youth Summit and things like Shout Out are for. Um, so yeah, those are the projects I've worked on. Um, and I think, is that my final slide? No? Oh, okay, this, so this is the first round of Shout Out Speakers. Um, 
this is just from a report um, and we have more shout out speakers on the website of course um, but this is just the first round of young people and then the second round what we actually did was um, a lot of the shout out young people and the Catalyst um, Youth Summit um, they all wanted Aboriginal young people involved in the summit as well but due to funding issues as usual um, you're not allowed to incorporate the two together so uh, what we actually did was with this uh, the second round we actually um, added Aboriginal young people and encouraged them to apply. So we have three young people from regional WA, um, and then we have three young people from Metro. And you know, he, even having them in, in the room together when they were training was so amazing because a lot of them, you know, obviously they have diverse experiences, but just the conversations they were having, and I think Kenzie before mentioned around, it's hard to explain something to someone who is not of the same culture as you or the same background as you. Um, so I think for a lot of them, it was just really like an eye-opener and it has really encouraged a lot of them to go out and advocate um, and, you know, speak up um, and, and do what they have to do as an active citizen um, in this current day and age, you know. So, yeah, that's, that's an amazing shout-out. Um, and I think that's my final slide, no? Yeah, okay, so this is um, a little quote I want to leave you guys with around inclusion. Um, and I think it's very important to, to remember this uh, because often we talk about inclusion, about diversity, and, but we don't actually know what that looks like, you know? It, practically, how does that actually look like? So I think having a look at this and understanding, even if it's not young people, just around people, you know, people with disabilities, how are you including them in the conversation? How are you providing a voice for them? Um, are you talking on behalf of them or are you actually giving them the mic and allowing them to speak about their experiences? And I think that's very, very important. And this is, uh, a friend of mine actually sent this to me just last week. And when I saw it, I, was, I just knew I had to add it to this slide. So yeah, just, that's the final now I want to leave you guys on. Um, but yeah, please stay in touch. And my details are on the next slide. Um, if, yeah, if you guys want to ever get in touch with me um, and yeah, talk to multicultural young people or young people in general. But yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Tamkin. Wow, I think uh, Scott Morrison and his government could uh, do with some of this. <laughs> I'm so inspired. Wow. I had no idea when I was growing up that, you know, young people were doing all these amazing things. And I think if we'd had these kinds of mentors, you know, it could have been different. Uh, so the last speaker, Zal, we have. Um, Zal, I think I'm going to pronounce this wrong, so you might have to correct me when you come up here. Zal Kanga Parabaya <laughs> um, is a multidisciplinary artist from Perth. He was West Australian of the Year finalist in 2018 in the youth category, creative co-coordinator at Propel Youth Arts, WA, and currently involved in many community projects, including Moon Brewery, which we went to um, for National Science Week. And uh, here he is. Welcome to the stage. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? Everyone out the back? Excellent. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Zal. Um, Kaya, Nyan Koral Zal. So, hello, my name is Zal. Nyan Jiripin wa Bidi Baba, Nunga Boja Nunuk. I'm really happy, a little bit tired to be here today with you on <laughs> Nunga Country, and I want to pay my respect to elders past and present. Um, so I just wanted to firstly thank uh, Kenzie for what you were speaking about. Uh, thanks for your story. And I'm also finding my purpose. I was just actually just quit my job. I was being bullied for six months. Um, and that just happened like last week. I just quit. So getting closer to the purpose. And I really appreciate the work that uh, you know, counsellors and people like that uh, are doing to help people. And also I just wanted to thank Tam uh, Tamkin for all the work that you're doing to Myan um, and Yakwa. That was actually, Yakwa was the first place that I got involved in art and um, I volunteered for Homies Where My Heart Is in 2012, I think. 
So thanks for that. So, <laughs> oh, <giddy. laughs> so I was, um, so I just wanted to tell you a few little stories and little, little nitbits from my life, um, focusing, I guess, on some of the mentors that I have had. And so I was born in Wurunga, which is in Sydney, and I'm Zoroastrian. Uh, I moved to India when I was pretty young, and I lived in a village called Raniumba. And now I live in Belia. Uh, not in Abelia, but in Belia. <laughs> Belia means a river. <laughs> in, no, no, oh, sorry, that's a bit loud. Um, and I'm the youth ambassador for Western Australia for state government for this year. And I work with young people at Propel Youth Arts WA, and I'm an artist. And I'm a human being, and I'm connected to everything. So as you're all here, and you're listening, and quiet, and very quiet, you're probably feeling a bit soft, probably a bit tired now. It's getting late. It's bedtime. It's past my bedtime, definitely. Uh, yeah, have a yawn if you like. Yeah. <laughs> You're probably feeling a bit gentle. And you know, you have this sense of connecting and coming together. And maybe deep down you might be feeling a bit hurt, a bit tired, a bit restless. Uh, thinking about, oh, I have to send that email or reply to that person or something like that. <laughs> or maybe you weren't and now I just brought it up and there you are. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, or maybe someone isn't here who you wish that they were might be feeling a bit alone, but you know, that's okay. Um, our spirits and our energy is here, and everything is connected. And as we sit on this land, and we join ourselves here, you can feel the energy. You can probably hear it if you listen close enough. You can hear it before all the rain coming down, washing everything away. You can feel us coming together. And, you know, we might hold these badges, all of us, like, um, I'm the speaker tonight, <laughs> you know, and I hold certain knowledge, youth ambassador, I work at Propel, all these things, but um, here we are together. So I have a question for you first, and you can yell out the answer, you don't have to yell, you can just gently say, but... Question is, what is this? Yeah, glass. Keep going. More things. What was that? Sand. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's good one. Yeah. Anyone else? Vessel to calorie liquids. Nice. Someone's idea. That's a good one. Anyone? Anyone else? Glass half full. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> That's a good one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I guess, you know, we, anyone, anyone have any more? Sorry? See-through. Nice, yeah. So, you know, as we kind of continue putting names on it, and we get to a point where we just see it for what it is. After we've put all the names, we kind of get to this point where you just realise... What is it? <laughs> and as the words run out, we see it for tr what it truly is. And as uncle shared with me, um, same uncle actually, Kenzie was speaking about. <laughs> um, to sit in front of the waves, he said, and to hear it, and okay, I said, I, I see it, I see the ocean, it's the ocean, you know, it's the waves. And I'm saying, why do I even have to sit here? Why do I have to do this? And he says, listen, it's your greatest teacher. And as you sit and you listen and you look, you find the meaning beyond what you see. So with this thought, 
I'd like to invite you to maybe connect a bit <laughs> and to see past and to hold someone's hand maybe or shoulder or something like that, whatever feels comfortable. And yeah, that's <laughs> straight in the face. Yeah, maybe just connect with someone close to you in a way that you feel comfortable. You can do it, it's okay, if you want. Um, yeah, and we can just feel a bit more connected and welcome. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. And as you do this, you feel, you know, the child coming out. <laughs> Children of your soul. Yeah, you can laugh a bit, giggle a bit. It's okay. So I hope that with that you feel a bit more at peace. And I want to acknowledge um, Uncle Sean and Anna as well for teaching me these things, teaching me this, and being a mentor of mine. So you can keep holding on to each other if you want, or you can let go and be comfortable, whichever, whatever you like. Um, so I wanted to speak a bit more about shifting perspective, softening the mind. And I've been listening to a CD every single day in my car, and it's um, Pop No Now Story. It's been passed down for a long time. The cares of everything. And Kenzie was talking about purpose. I mean, I mean, you're also talking about purpose, about what you're doing. You're so passionate about all the things that you're doing. And you can really feel that and see it. And in this CD, it's called The Cares of Everything, and it speaks about this place, southwest of Western Australia. It speaks about the hills and the glacier that was here before. It speaks about the birds and the trees, and the river, and all the waterways, all the fish. And it speaks about everything's purpose, to care for everything, and our purpose as human beings to care for everything. So as I listen to that every day, it slowly starts to connect all the little dots in my mind all the things, all the neurons, everything in my head, it connects them all to realizing my purpose, which is to care for everything. And when I was younger, though, I felt a strong sense of wanting more constantly. If my mom gave me one cookie, I would ask for two. <laughs> if she got me a bike, I would ask for two, <laughs> or a guitar, I would ask for two. So, you know, I wanted to be the best, I wanted to be the best musician, I wanted to be the best at what I do, you know, a lot of pressure, I guess, I, I felt a lot of pressure. And at the same time, I did also feel a lot of, uh, kind of low self-worth as well. And I think that all came from that place of feeling misunderstood, not heard. I think a lot of young boys feel that, and a lot of young people in general feel that. Um, it was also at a young age, though, that I realised that all of that was a deception. And I'm sure a lot of you feel that coming to those realizations as you do mindfulness practice or you meditate, gently unlearning a lot of things that you're doing. And as I was told, you know, we spend the first 25 years of our lives soaking things up. I still have one year left soaking things up. <laughs> and the rest of our lives trying to squeeze it all out and get rid of it. So I wanted to share you some other lessons that my dad taught me. So that's one of them <laughs> that he says. I got one, le one year left. Also one year left to get all the youth grants, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the you know, things they taught me about letting go, being present, feeling what's going on around me, the energy, and trusting my gut feeling. So my dad told me a story. He tells me a lot of stories. Um, but this is one of them that I was just thinking about before I got here. Um, and I just found it really funny, but I really like it as well. 
So I'll tell you it now. So the student said to the master, 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 how do I reach a state of Zen? And the master says, is there a temple nearby? Oh, and I tell this to my partner, she's a marine scientist, so I say, is there an ocean nearby? And the student says, yes, I'm actually about to go to the temple or the ocean. <laughs> and I'm about to meditate or swim. And the master says, enter from there. So the student thinks about this, yeah, that makes sense. I can do that thing, reach the in. Makes sense. Oh, but master, what if there's no temple around? What if I can't meditate? What if there's no ocean around? What if I can't go swimming? And the master says, enter from there. And that's the story. <laughs> takes a while to click. It's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> it really does take a while to click. So, you know, I think that's one of the stories that my dad kind of told me when I was younger. And I actually just didn't get it for a very long time. <laughs> and and as, I, as I grew, you know, music was the thing that really kept me sane. And there have been many times where I haven't had a guitar or you know, a voice. I sometimes lose my voice or I haven't, you know, I've been so stressed out that I don't even take the time to do what I really love. And that story's come back to me and I've just realized, oh, enter from there. So I just always keep those words in the back of my head. So there's another little story that I wanted to share that my dad told me as well. So this one's a bit funnier. Actually, it's not really. They're both like dad stories. So then none of them are funny. <laughs> um, so there were three monks driving a truck. <laughs> and they had a pretty long day. And they were feeling pretty tense, as monks do. And they're a bit worried that they might hit a kangaroo. You know, and so they're discussing, they're arguing how to avoid this. You know, one monk's going to watch out front and drive. The other one's going to watch outside. The third one's going to watch out the other side. And all the while, discussing, planning, arguing, worrying, they hit three kangaroos. They didn't even notice with their huge truck. And they kept driving, finally in their positions, waiting to hit the three kangaroos that they already did. So that's another story that I really like, that my dad tells me. Um, he has told me. So I guess the reason that I wanted to share with you those few little stories. Um, it's because you know, recently I've actually connected back with my dad. When I was quite young, my mom and dad split up and I moved to India and all around everywhere. <laughs> and then back here, I didn't have much contact with my dad. And only recently I'm, um, you know, I'm chatting with him more. And I'm also realizing a lot about what this world has to offer young boys and young men and how you know, a lot of the things that we've been taught come out usually as anger or frustration, usually physical or verbal, or we internalize those things back into ourselves and get very frustrated and feel a lot of shame, guilt. You know, and I've noticed a lot of the mentors that I've had as men have also given that to me, just like my dad has as well. And I've started to speak about that to him. You know, speak about some of the things even when we were, when I was a boy, going to like the swimming pool, you know, he'd point out like the girls and say, oh, look at that little girl. Now I think about that, I'm like, that's disgusting, dad. What are you doing? Why are you telling me to look at that girl? 
in that way, you know. So I actually brought that up with him and he apologized to me like straight away. So that was really good. You know, I think and these kind of stories they come with other things from our mentors and people that we look up to. I think it is very important that you know young people have a voice and that um, you know as we move through life even from the people that are teaching us the most to still be having that two-way conversation. Um, so another just final little story that I kind of wanted to share with you before I finish up and I'll just finish with a song on each other. Um, is a conversation I was having with my grandma today actually. So she's over from India and she lives in that village that I lived in. And she's been here for six months or so, uh, living in our house. And we had a conversation today and in Gujarati. And I don't speak very well. I don't speak Gujarati very well, but I speak well enough. And you know, we were talking about how here, as she's been here and experienced the different culture, how she feels so alone, how she feels so disconnected how, you know, in our home in India, our whole family lives together in one house, and that's extended family. And, you know, over there, she'd cut her finger, and the whole village would come to her house and ask her, oh, you all right? <laughs> Do you need some help? You know, and, and over here, it takes like three weeks to get a doctor's appointment. <laughs> so she was very impressed. And I guess through that conversation, obviously I tried to explain a bit about how Australian culture is a bit different to Indian culture and you know, it's a bit of a double-edged sword and you know, there's certain good things about India, certain bad things about India too. But it's something that I really got from what my grandma was trying to tell me was that it's very important to find community. I feel like that's what we're kind of doing here today together. It's very important that we look to coming together and being connected and also realizing not just as people that we're connected um, but as the whole earth, land, universe that everything is connected. I studied physics, I'm a physicist and I, s I didn't get it still. I had my main field was quantum mechanics, quantum tunneling, which is where things teleport through walls. We'll talk about that later. And all it took was pop null to actually just say that everything's connected. There's energy and waves, and it all connects everything together. And that's why you can feel these things. You can feel, you walk into a place and you can feel that something's off or it feels right. You can feel the energy from other people. That's all it took for me to click into understanding that my purpose is to care for everything and to connect. So, some groups that I found that to connect to me are Kundam, which means dreaming, with an M, Kundam. Kundar means shame, which I don't want to talk about. It's not that. Kundam, dreaming. Uh, another group is Wali Lap Kanajil, Dilbi Kanajil, Majital Morna. These are all choirs, reconciliation choirs that I've joined and started learning language from here. And I wanted to share with you a song before I finish. Um, just to share some of that community with you. Um, so I'll just get on my guitar. The song is called Universal Love and it was written by Delaray Morrison. And <laughs> it was translated by Kobe Arthur Morrison, from English to Numa, and that's her son, and he kind of runs Kundam Choir, and all these choirs are community choirs, so you can come and ask me later, and anyone can come and join, and learn some language, and learn some culture. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to play that song for you. Hopefully my guitar's still in tune, the rain's. Okay, 
still good. Hopefully you can kind of hear me. I'll just like do this. Can you hear the guitar okay? So I'll be singing it in Nunga and then in English. And you can kind of understand the meaning there. You can just relax, get comfortable, lie down if you want, and just listen.
Thanks. Wow, thank you so much. I feel like that was a real special privilege to listen to that. Um, so it always seems like when there's a really special event, it happens to rain, but then it makes the people that, you know, really should be here come, make the effort to come. So thank you so much once again to Kenzie, to Tamkin and to Zhao. Please give them a round of applause. Um, I think it might be a little bit late for questions, but if you do want to kind of speak to them, they're sitting in the crowd. Um, thank you so much once again. I'm truly inspired and humbled by all the amazing things that these young people are doing. I'm, I'm 34 now, so <laughs> I can probably say you're young. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm speechless. I can't talk after that performance. Um, please welcome, you're welcome to come back here anytime. If you're new to the Buddhist Society of Western Australia, we run meditation classes and this space is always open. Um, doesn't matter, you know, just to come and chill out. So thank you once again and thank you for coming and have a good night, everyone.